Welcome everyone to another edition of Play It Through, and on this edition, it's Monster in My Pocket, brought to us by Konami. While many now may not remember Monster in My Pocket, it actually had a pretty big following in the early 90s. The series started as mainly little figurines that were collectible and were actually released by Matchbox, the creators, of course, of the classic Matchbox cars. They featured all kinds of different monsters, mythology, religious, and literary fantasy characters. They came in packs of like three or four figures and were of course highly collectible. Not as much in North America as they were in Europe and UK. The figures were popular enough to get 11 full series made of them. They were also made into a comic book, an animated special, and of course, the video game we're playing today. So here we go with Monster in My Pocket for the NES. I always liked the little intro to the game, showing actually a pocket with all the monsters flying out of it, then coming to the press start screen where you get to see one monster hiding in the shadows just moving its eyeballs all around. You can then pick one or two player, which is actually a two player co-op game and can be a lot of fun. When you select one player though, you select which creature you want to play as, whether you want to play as the vampire or the classic monster from Frankenstein. Usually I see runs with Vampire, so I'm going to be playing as Frankenstein, though they almost play completely identical. Our main boss is the Warlock, who's trying to take over, and the monsters see him on the television before springing into action to go take him on. What makes Monster in My Pocket unique is the fact that not only does it have all the mythos of all the classic monsters, the uniqueness of also being small lends itself well, as you can see that we look of course very small and we're inside of a giant house for the first stage. This also translates well when we're traveling inside of a kitchen in the second level of the game. The controls work rather well. You have your main attack, and you have a jump. You can do a double jump, and your attack actually does a nice little wave attack, which actually stays on screen for a period of time, and can actually take out more than one enemy with a singular attack. It takes a little bit of time to get used to the overall attacking, because there is a slight delay from when you can attack again, so it's not immediate, so you have to kind of plan out some of your attacks. Usually I find myself jumping over and avoiding some enemies while using my attack on other ones when I know I'll have plenty of time to get away. Of course, early on it starts off rather easy of you just mowing down creature after creature, and the game is very linear, so you're not going to really get lost in the game. After one of the coolest sequences of the game, of just running down a hill being able to run through all the enemies, we make it to the end of the area and move on to the first boss of the game. The first boss is spring -Heeled Jack, of course a classic UK folklore character. He jumps up in the air, back and forth, usually completely over you, so as long as you don't jump into the air as well, you'll have no problem being able to avoid him. And then he'll just throw out some knives when he reaches the top of his jump. The knives move in one center straight down, and of course two to the left and right diagonally, so you'll be able to stand in between them in order to avoid him. You can keep launching in punches, and it does take quite a few to take him down, but it ends up being a rather easy fight. While you do have 5 health, as represented in the lower left corner, you do drain health pretty quickly at times when you get to the later levels, and there's a ton of enemies on screen. Thankfully, they give you a lot of health, but at the end of the game when you have to do a boss rush, it can be rather difficult to keep all your health. The second level is really cool. I love the fact that you have enemies that throw giant sugar cubes at you, as well as you have giant apples and other things. The second part of level number two had you inside of a giant kitchen. So we've seen this a few times in other NES games, for example, Chippendale Rescue Rangers, but I've always been a fan of that style, so for this game, it always fit in well with me. 
Most enemies early on only take one hit, so you can either avoid them or of course attack them. The ones later on will take two or even three hits at times, and these are the enemies where it really comes down crucially to figuring out which ones are going to be worth attacking and which ones are going to be worth avoiding. There are a lot of enemies on screen sometimes, ones that are flying and ones on the ground, but overall, once you play a few times, you'll be able to move in and out between the enemies rather easily. The second boss of the game is Bigfoot. Now he's actually a Frost Bigfoot, more of like an abominable snowman, as he runs back and forth, can throw ice at you to freeze you in place to run into you to do damage, he'll stop in place and then do a big charge across the screen. When he does this, of course, jump over him and try to get behind him to do damage. Sometimes when he's facing right, he'll end up turning back left in order to do the charge, so he'll end up running into you, but thankfully he doesn't do this all the time and you should be able to get plenty of hits in on him in order to take him out. We then move on to stage number 3, Crisis from Underground. The large dragon heads here are quite annoying is because they stay in place, I don't think you can actually destroy them, or if you can, it takes a lot of hits, and they consistently keep firing fireballs, so just try to get past them as quick as possible. While continuing down the slope, we don't run it down in it quite as quickly as we did in the first level of the game. However, on this time around, we have to watch out for giant golf balls while also taking out flying enemies. Thankfully, there is some health along the way to heal you back up before you move on to the second part of stage number three. The second part starts us off dropping down all the way down to the bottom into a giant sewer. You can hang close to the right wall, but when you reach the bottom, the camera will not scroll, so you'll have to back up a little bit in case you actually want to see what's coming ahead. The worst and most annoying enemies here, as you can see, is the water in the background will spill out, which can hurt you, as well as demons pop out as well. These guys take several hits to take out, so just try to get past them quickly. And then for the next part, there's a whole bunch of fish jumping out of the water, which you can easily run by until you get stuck waiting on this floating thing. It'll slowly keep moving back and forth, and you'll just have to keep standing on it in order for it to move. Anytime you jump up into the air, it stops in place. So do your best to keep avoiding all the fish jumping up and attacking when you need to. Grab the health at the end and move on to the boss fight for stage number three. Now this is probably the toughest boss so far, and this is a giant squid-like creature that pops out of the water. Now this guy has two tentacles on the left and right side here, and he moves them up and down, and you'll have to avoid them while being able to get in close to the head in order to do damage to him. Basically, I stay on the right side, jumping up immediately when the first one comes up, attack a few times, then back away from him in order to avoid the tentacle as it does its big up and down motion through most of the screen, and then, as it's retreating, hit it a couple more times, and right about at the eye level of the left eye, jump up into the air once again, so that you can avoid getting hit from the tentacle as it makes its last appearance per cycle. He'll then retreat on the ground, and then he'll end up popping back up. You can always see from the little splashes on the left and right sides of the center splash for where the right and left tentacles are going to be popping up. Either way, once he's taken care of, we rack up our score and move on to stage number four. When the next level begins, you'll be moving left along a giant fence in the background. However, you don't want to just keep moving left. When you jump in the air, you'll notice that you'll cling on to the fence itself and start climbing up. Climb up to the very top of the fence, and once on top, then start heading over to the left, which is where we need to go. The enemies along here, the red demons, are easy to take out with singular hits, and then you'll have to jump over some spikes that are lacing the top of the fence. Just be careful that you don't get too closed up on one of the demons and the spikes, and then jump on to the giant construction equipment and start riding along all the spikes. Along this little path, you'll have to consistently keep attacking flying enemies coming at you. They usually come straight at you, so you'll be able to easily hit them. A few, though, will be too low to hit while standing up. You'll have to duck down quickly and attack them in order to hit them before they run into you. When you make it to the end of the area, jump off the giant hook, and now you'll have enemies that will throw out little hooks from their bodies. They have nice little timing on these, so it's easy to jump in on them and hit them a few times, and you'll have to hit them like three times or so in order to take them out. Once you get past those guys, though, we move on to the second segment of level number four. Now here, start moving up the giant beams, and when you do so, you'll have these enemies that are jump up and will start sliding down with a giant slide kick. Pretty unique enemies here, just be careful when you jump over them that you don't end up jumping and landing right on top of them. 
When you're in the air, they don't activate even if you're really close. They only activate once you've landed on ground right near them. So you can use this to break up the large group of the sliding enemies. When you reach the top, you're going to have some Chimera enemies trying to launch fire at you. Just jump over the fire and attack them when they start running towards you. These guys aren't too bad to deal with. At the end, drop down and when you do so, you'll start moving on a giant elevator that's moving upwards. Enemies will dive bomb at you, but stand still in one spot and just go left and right attacking over and over again in order to take out all the enemies that are diving towards you. There is a decent amount of the diving enemies, but once you get past it, you'll be able to grab two pieces of health and move on to the next boss. No surprising, it's a goblin on a giant piece of construction equipment, the giant hook that we rode earlier. This guy can be quite annoying, he comes down from the ceiling at first. He stands still for a few seconds in the center of the screen allowing you to hit him a couple of times, before he then throws out projectiles and then moves off screen in one of different directions. He'll then usually come from the left side and you can jump over him and repeat the process, or he'll come from the right side. Just learning that you can jump through the top of the hook and be able to get in between the projectiles that he fires out are key not to lose too much health during this boss fight. While I think the squid can be a little bit tougher, this guy ends up taking a lot longer because you can only attack him a couple of times while he's on screen. However, once you knock him off the hook, you complete at level 4 and we move on to stage 5. What level would be complete without an oriental themed stage? Should we move on to stage 5, the oriental illusion, and you start off inside of a giant bamboo forest. Kinda weird that you're still really small, so you can imagine that the bamboo forest itself is also rather small here. Watch out over here to the right that you have some giant pits that you'll have to do the double jump in order to get over. The double jump in the game, while it works for the most part, you have to be careful with it and activate the double jump part of it when you're at the very top of your jump, or else when you're coming back down you won't be able to activate the double jump and you'll end up falling down faster than where you would particularly want it to go. Watch out for the barbed wire barbs on, of course, the barbed wire fence, and then continue over to the right, introducing the most annoying enemy in the game. These guys will hone in on you and they only follow you when they're facing the other direction, and when they do so, they hover in on the bottom of you and just stay there. These guys end up hitting me three or four times usually before I'm able to get off screen and get past them. They can be rather annoying to hit because they move so quickly and since they hover right on the same spot that you do, it can be almost impossible to dodge them once you've relanded. After jumping off the side here, be sure to move the camera back over to the left so that you can actually see what's ahead of you again, and continue moving to the right when you'll be introduced to a couple new enemies. These guys throw out bones to you, and these guys are extremely annoying as they like to hide, so it's hard to see exactly where they're standing unless you look at the bottom of the column, and you can just barely see the sprite of their legs. Thankfully, there's only about five of them in the area, and once you get past them, thankfully, you'll get at least one piece of health before moving on. The next part has kind of the oriental walls in the background, and all these little goblins are going to jump out of them. Thankfully, these guys aren't too bad, but if you move quickly, there's going to be a lot of them on screen at once. Along with these guys, though, the other guys that were throwing out bones will also attack you near the end of the area. Thankfully, once you make it to the next screen, it's time for the next boss fight, and this one is a ghost that has five versions of herself. When she attacks, she of course will fire a projectile straight at you, and only one of the five ghosts is the real one, and this changes every time, with no discernible difference to tell which one you're actually able to hit right from the start, because they always come in at the same exact pattern. Basically, I find myself jumping around attacking a random one, and then a few seconds later, if I don't hit the right one, of course the real one reveals itself, and I can prepare myself for that, getting to the right position to get it to go off screen, avoid the projectile, and land in a hit or two before it goes off and resets. This fight also can take a little bit of time because, of course, you don't have too many opportunities to actually do damage to the boss. However, once you knock her out of the air, she'll land and you'll move on to stage number 6.
Stage number six is the last battle at Monster Mountain. Now this is really the final level of the game, though we do have one more boss after completing this level. This level is rather tough. It starts off in a giant cave as you're working your way through, trying to get to the center of where the location of the final boss is. Along this area though, you'll have some droplets coming down from the ceiling, like a typical cave-like level, and you'll also have giant T-Rexes that will appear that will shoot fire from their mouths. Just be sure to get in close and duck underneath the fire and deliver a few hits to get rid of these guys. Next up, you're going to have some bull enemies charging at you. The ground itself will actually start rising up and down, and when it does so, when it reaches the course of the spike ceiling up top, be sure to duck down. Even though it looks like it barely clips you, it does not hurt you, and it also takes out any enemy that's still currently on screen at the time. Thankfully, the area is not too long, and usually it's pretty easy to get through, because the next area can be a real pain. You have giant four-headed dragons that are flying around launching lightning bolts at you. These guys are some of the most obnoxious enemies in the game because you're in a really confined space, they take up a lot of space, and they take a lot of hits to kill. Usually I find it best just to kind of maneuver in and out of them, watching out for the lightning bolt as best as possible, and get off the screen as quickly as I can. Thankfully there is health available right at the end of the segment before you make it to another elevator-like segment. And the dragons do not follow you, if they're still alive when you make it to that end part, they'll just fly overhead and go off screen. As the elevator is now descending, you'll have all these openings in the background as you can see, and a demon will pop out of each one every time you go past it. Thankfully these are single hit enemies, and they do jump around a little bit, so they are a tiny bit annoying, but not nearly as bad as the other enemies we've already seen in this particular level. When the elevator ends up reaching the bottom, move to the right and you'll have another one of those dinosaurs attacking you. Once again, just get in close, stuck underneath, and attack them a few times to get rid of these guys. Thankfully though, you're near the end of the area and we move on to the next screen. This is the boss rush of the game, and thankfully they give you two pieces of health in case you've lost some during the elevator segment before, so you should have just about full health going into this boss rush. This is obviously the toughest area of the game because you have to refight every boss that we fought so far. Starting, of course, with spring -Heel Jack. Once again, our strategies are going to remain the same for all these bosses. We start off with spring -Heel Jack. Once again, he jumps up into the air. Just be sure not to jump up into him and keep attacking him every time he lands back on the ground. It won't take too many hits, once again, to take him out. And then you move over to the right and there'll be a little bit of an elevator sequence. But don't worry, there's no enemies during any of these elevator parts of this boss rush. When you reach the bottom, though, you go right into the next boss fight. Next up is the Abominable Snowman slash Bigfoot. Once again, he moves back and forth dashing and he will freeze you in place, so be very careful of this as we're trying to conserve our health. One thing you've probably noticed throughout the whole game is if an enemy is flashing at the exact right moment when you need it, they can actually run through you without damaging you, so this can actually be used to help you, especially during this boss fight, though you cannot rely on it at all because it's very finicky with the hit detection. Next up is the giant Kraken slash Squid boss that we fought in the third level of the game. They do a pretty cool job here with the actual background fading away to the black screen as what's needed in order for the giant sprite to be able to come to life here. Our strategy is always the same as we're attacking this guy, avoiding that tentacle at all costs. You can choose the left or right side. Like I said before, I always choose the right side as I find it a little bit easier to deal with overall. Attacking a couple of times, jumping back up into the air away from him to avoid the big sweep, and then once his left eye has just about reached underground, jump up into the air again in order to avoid getting hit by that last bit of the tentacle. This fight, once again, does take time, just like all the rest of the bosses that we're going to be dealing with, but with the right strategy, you should be able to avoid taking too much damage here. Try to have at least two or three pieces of health left before we make it to the next enemy. Once he's done, run over for another elevator part as the screen will scroll down as we get ready to do a rematch against the Gremlin on top of Giant Construction Hook. This guy is just as annoying this time around as he was the first time as he descends from the ceiling, launches those projectiles out at you, and then disappears off screen. 
Be prepared for when it attacks you from the left side, goes off screen, and then will come right back at you from the right side. Be sure to be able to actually have enough space between the projectiles and him so you can jump over the hook to avoid taking damage when he goes off screen. He works the same exact pattern it looks like each time you fight him, so you'll know what direction he's coming from each time after you've fought him a few times. Of course, taking a decent amount of hits can be quite annoying with this guy, so just do your best just to avoid at least taking damage. You need to be a little bit more cautious and make the battle take a little bit longer. You want to have some health left before you end up making it to the ghost boss. Once he's done, the hook ends up fading away, we run back over to the right, and once again we have another one of the elevator sequences, and this time the background comes back into play because the ghost doesn't take up nearly as much graphical power as the previous two bosses did. The rematch against the ghost is the same as the first time. Five ghosts appear, only one's the real one. After the other ones disappear, she fires out a projectile at you that you'll have to dodge, in which case she'll then go also off screen, coming towards you wherever you're standing. So just avoid it, and of course keep attacking her. It's gonna take a while, but thankfully we do get some health after defeating her. You'll get two pieces of health once you defeat this boss, so if you have only one health left when you beat her, you'll at least have three going into the boss of the area. After she goes down, grab the last pieces of health and move on to the boss of the game. This of course is Warlock, and he can be rather difficult at first. He disappears and reappears at the top of the screen at different locations. After a few seconds, he will end up lifting his arms up into the air and fire a lightning bolt at you. Jump up and attack him once, maybe twice, and then as soon as he raises his hand, immediately land if possible and start running away from the opposite direction of him. If you do this correctly, you'll be able to just barely avoid the lightning bolt that he ends up shooting out. Of course, being one of the final bosses, this is actually a pretty annoying, and actually he's tougher than the last boss that we'll be fighting in the game. The lightning bolt can actually be pretty finicky at times, which is what makes this fight so difficult. Hitting him really isn't too much of a challenge since you can get some good height on your jumps and be able to land in usually two or three hits per cycle. Once he's taken care of, you can prepare yourselves for, well, one last boss. In my favorite moment of the game, you think it's over, you get an ending, but nope, the battle's not over yet as Warlock emerges from the television and immediately starts attacking you Wonka Vision style. When he appears in the background, you'll be able to actually deliver hits to him. Of course, the picture signal will go wavy, in which case you won't be able to hit him. He'll fire out beams from his eyes, and when the beams land, he forms two little demons. If the beams do not land on solid ground and instead just go off screen, no demons, of course, will end up spawning from that. Just avoid the demons because they take several hits to take out, so just jump over him and let him walk off screen. 
While this fight, of course, is in a little bit closer quarters because the boss takes up so much more space than the previous boss, I end up finding this boss fight easier than the one we just dealt with. And thankfully, you also get full health before going into this fight, so it makes it a lot easier. Once you deliver the last blow to him, though, you can sit down and, well, enjoy the staff credits for Monster in My Pocket. I always found the ending of the monster in my pocket pretty cool that even though you've already seen the ending of the game, you have one last boss fight as kind of that classic horror, the monster isn't quite dead, and uh, this is one of the many little charms about this game. It also has a great soundtrack as you've been listening to throughout, and while the game is a little bit linear, the graphics are actually quite nice. It was released in 1991, so a little bit later in the NES life cycle, but it shows and it's well done. There's not a lot of slowdown even with the enhanced graphics. The bosses are well done, and overall the game is a very fun experience. I actually wouldn't mind have seen more games based on the Monster in My Pocket series. One other interesting note though, is that even though they created 11 series of the figures, this one is based only on really series 1 of those figures. And actually, a figure that is actually not included in the game as a character was actually given away as a special edition character in the box if you bought the game new. But besides that character, every other Series 1 character appears either as one of the main characters that you play as, of course, or as one of the many, many villains in the game. But with that, that's going to wrap up this edition of Play It Through. I'd like to thank you for watching, and of course, I hope you enjoyed.